Hey, good evening from here in the UK. Whereabouts are you in the world? I'm in beautiful, sunny Montreal, Canada. How are you doing? Oh, yes. With your uh, legalized um, products uh, out <laughs> Indeed. there. I've Indeed. actually uh, been watching the Canadian cannabis companies, the fluctuations and the down right now. Looks like uh, it could be a good investment while they're down. So congratulations on your huge success online, especially with this Joe Rogan stuff. Thank you. And I think that I watched in one of your videos, you know, saying, talking about how people react to situations and to be more stoic, especially when it comes to cyberbullying, things like that. And you use this story of the honey badger. Are you okay to tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Uh, first, thank you for having me on, and it's nice to meet you online. Thank you for that. Uh, so in Chapter 8 of The Parasitic Mind, uh, I explain, you know, I, I have a whole bunch of call to actions. How do we get rid of these dreadful ideas that have been consuming the West, infecting our brains, and so on? And so one of the things that I propose is that we take on the mentality, the mindset of a honey badger. Now, for those of you who don't know, a honey badger is the size of a small dog. And yet it is so fierce, so ferocious that when approached by six adult lions, they will retreat in cowardice. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's literally true. There are clips you can go on YouTube uh, where you see that happening. There's, there's another clip that I just wow. discovered recently where the honey badger was in the death grip of a python. Now, when a python has you in a death grip, the chances of you getting out of that is are almost nil. Well, not only does the the honey badger get out of that death grip. When it gets out, it doesn't run away. It says, well, now that I've escaped, I'm going to now kill you. What? And so it then goes <laughs> after the python, kills the python, and there are two jackals coming to steal the dead py python from the honey badger. It then attacks them and gets them to run away. So what do I mean by having that mentality? If you have a set of I beliefs, that you can that are well articulated that are based on first principles that you can defend with reason and logic then never cower away have the attitude of a honey badger in defending your principles that's what allows me to take all these positions that are quote controversial and uh, and yet here i am unscathed why because if you come after me you better have your story straight because <laughs> if you miss i'm coming after you your ancestors and your descendants <laughs> so when the honey badger was in the throes of this thing with the python did the python look like it was winning at first oh it, it completely right i mean it really it, it's it's coiled around its body it's every time that an animal takes a breath it is getting closer and closer to suffocation as a matter of fact if you go and look at the clip it's it's available on youtube when the when the honey badger finally extricates itself from the death grip of the python, at first you see it, it's a bit kind of uh, wobbly and dizzy because it has been, you know, restricted in ways that typically would cause something to suffocate. And yet the first instinct it has, I'm going to kill you. And so uh, <laughs> that's the attitude. So I'm not, I'm not, people shouldn't mistake my uh, analogy with, you know, violence, right? What I'm saying is be ideologically fierce don't cower because you're afraid of the e-mob or cyber bullying or your colleagues or your friend who's gonna unfriend you on facebook anybody who cannot stand the possibility that you may have a differing opinion is not worthy of your friendship don't let the door hit their ass on the way out yeah and it's tricky isn't it with internet cyber bullies because they can sway people against you and you feel that if you just ignore them and not get your side of the story out there, those people are just going to run with the BS being fed to them by the cyber bullies. So how do you deal with situations like that? So usually I attack back. In other words, I'm, I simply am unable to walk away. Although there have been situations where people uh, whom I trust have said, look, it, 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 it is much worse for you to dignify these responses. It, it just soils you. But it's very hard for me to walk away because it's just not part of my temperament. And so usually, so I'll give you a, a concrete example that happened recently. I was, uh, I, I put out a tweet that was completely innocuous. It was meant to demonstrate how kind and sensitive my wife is. We had gone to a cafe and there was a server who was taking her order 
the particular server looked like they were transgendered. And at one point, she, my wife was pointing to the, the, the server's colleague to, to say, don't worry, he'll get the hang of it, meaning that whatever, the machine that he's using, he was a new server. But then she hesitated because she didn't know if she should say he'll get the hang of it or they'll get the hang of it. But then she didn't know if she should say they, because what if he doesn't identify as transgender? So she comes back to see me and to tell me that she was in a bit of a linguistic conundrum because she didn't want to hurt that person's feelings. That's it. So you would think that the response to my story would be, wow, what a sensitive and kind person she is. She didn't want to offend this person. Well, 23 million tweets and responses later over the next two days, uh, triggered by, you know, the luminary Einstein of the current uh, world, Valerie Bertinelli, who was a child star who wanted to exhibit her virtue credentials to the rest of the world. She gets the whole gang to come after me. I'm a transphobe. My wife is a moron who's mentally ill because she doesn't know how to address people when ordering coffee. When, of course, the original point was to show how kind and sensitive she is to the, that trans pronoun issue. And so did I cower in fear? No, I mocked them into oblivion. I, I, I hid underneath my desk. I have a, I have a series. I don't know if you've seen it on my, on my channel where I, where I uh, satirically hide under my desk because I'm so afraid of someone. For example, Donald Trump <laughs> is inaugurated while I hide under my desk. Uh, Kavanaugh becomes justice, uh, you know, justice. I hide under my desk. And so I hid under my desk because I was terribly afraid of the pronoun Taliban. And then I compared it to when we ran away from being executed in Lebanon as Lebanese Jews, the Islamic extremists were not nearly as uh, fear inducing as the Taliban of the pronoun brigade. So there you have oh it. Oh my goodness. So tell us a bit more about Lebanon then. You've piqued my curiosity now. Uh, well, Leb so I grew I was born in Lebanon. We are Lebanese Jews. We are part of the we were part of the last community of Jews that had steadfastly refused to leave Lebanon. Uh, throughout the 20th century, it became increasingly more precarious to be Jewish anywhere in the Middle East. And so all of the Jewish communities uh, communities were you know, magically disappearing. We, didn't, we don't know why. We don't know if there is any ideological religious fervor that might have caused the Jews to disappear. It must have been because lack of solar panels, as my hero, Bill Nye explained to us when he explained that the Bataclan attack in, in uh, Paris was not due to Islamic terror. It was due to, you know, climate change. But in any case, uh, so we were in Lebanon um, until the mid 70s when the civil war broke out. Uh, at that point, it was no longer feasible to be Jewish to and be Lebanese. So we put on our best sprinting running shoes and ran really quickly, hoping that we would avoid the separation of our heads from the rest of our bodies. So that's what happened in Lebanon. Good grief. How did you internalize that then? Did you have PTSD or did you, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, for the next 25 years or so, so I left Lebanon in 1975. I was 11 years old. So I was very entrenched in Lebanese society. I mean, Arabic is my mother tongue. I'm fully Lebanese. I'm uh, Arabic in you know, many of my cultural orientations. Uh, but for the next maybe 25, 30 years, it's only been a few years now, maybe 10 years that I don't have recurring nightmares uh, about my Lebanese experience. The typical uh, nightmare takes one of two forms. And I actually discussed this briefly in The Parasitic Mind. It's either the bad guys are coming to get us and then we run out of ammunition and therefore we're sitting ducks or the bad guys are coming after us and then my gun jams. And so I had shared that story uh, at one point, I think it was with the, uh, the, the gentleman who, who killed bin Laden. He, he came on my show, the, the Navy SEAL who killed bin Laden. And I think he was the first one to tell me that uh, soldiers often have those types of dreams and it's called the warrior uh, dream. Uh, now, in my case, it was, in a sense, much scarier than the warrior dream because I I wasn't a Navy SEAL. I didn't have machine guns. I didn't have weaponry. So it, in a sense, it was my subconscious uh, telling me that we were basically sitting ducks. And so I had those recurring nightmares and those difficulties for, you know, well over two decades. Uh, but luckily now it, it seems like it's part of a distant past, although, of course, it's part of my history. Is that because time has healed or have you done like yoga 
meditation, things like that? Uh, I think it's mainly time that has healed it. It's also, you know, I while my actual victimhood story, and I say actual because so many people in the West today manufacture stories of victimhood to gain bona fide credits, it's credits in full victimology. It's very difficult to have a greater victimology story than what I and the rest of my family went through. My, my parents were kidnapped by Fatah and some really bad things happened to them. So the things that I saw as a child, uh, no one should see in 50 lifetimes. Uh, I'm not defined my, by my victimhood. Rather, it is part of who I am. I'm happy to be here on this show telling the world about it, but it doesn't define me. Actually, what defines me is the fact that I went through that story and I've overcome it. So no one is saying that you should not internalize you know the bad things that have happened to you they are part of your identity but then don't wallow in them for the next 600 years right so that's why i'm not very uh, sympathetic to all sorts of cultural traditions that define their anchor points by their past uh you know historical grievances right that to me is a is a form of uh, pathetic whining that should have no place in a healthy mind right again We've all gone through difficult circumstances, some much more than others. But what makes us great is that we overcome them. I'm all about people harnessing the hardships that they've been through and recycling that energy into positive projects and inspiring people. So how would you say that you have harnessed what you went through to shape who you've become and the work you do? Right. Yeah, that's thank you. That's a great question. So, I mean, in, in, in the most direct way, uh, having gone through the Lebanese Civil War, I saw what happens to a society that is perfectly organized along the ethos of identity politics, because Lebanon, by definition, consti- by, by its constitution, is organized along identity politic lines. So the president has to be of a certain religion. The prime minister has to be of another religion. The number of seats you get in parliament depends on your religion. Uh, everything, everywhere is based on your religion. You, in, inside Lebanon, you have what's called an internal ID. In Arabic, it's called Hawiye. And that internal ID, the most important m- metric, if you'd like, on, on that identity card is not how tall you are or what your eye color is. It's what's your religion. And so Lebanon is the perfect epitome the perfect manifestation of what happens when everything is along tribal lines and so you might imagine then that i'm very motivated to warn the west that you may not want to be replicating the perfect society of identity politics that i've escaped from you don't want to repeat the balkans you don't want to repeat rwanda you don't want to repeat iraq all of those societies are perfectly constructed along identity politics so if nothing but that you know i am well place to 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 have written the parasitic mind because i see what happens when these very dangerous parasitic ideas uh, infect our minds causing us to slowly walk to the abyss of infinite lunacy which has happened throughout history so do you think that's part of human nature and it's immutable whether it's politics religion the gambinos versus the bananos that people just always form into tribalistic groups and attack or you know rival each other look coalitional psychology you're exactly right is a uh you know uh, indelible part of the of, of the the architecture of the human mind so we do view the world as red team versus blue team us versus them and and by the way that's one of the reasons why certainly abrahamic religions are so successful because they all have the narrative of us versus them there are the jews and the goys they are the believers in Christ and the rest of you idiots who are going to burn in hell. They are the, the, the believers in Islam and the kuffar, which is a derogatory term for all non-Muslims. So all of those religions have that narrative of us versus them. So, so I recognize that. And so that's why I argue in my book that to the extent that you wish to instantiate your need for coalitional belongingness, then belong to the tribe of truth rather than to political tribes or religious tribes. Now you might say, but what does that mean? What is true for you may not be true for me. Well, no, there are objective truths. So for, and that's actually one of the things that I talk about in the book when I discuss idea pathogens, some of these idea pathogens seek to remove the possibility of objective truths, right? So for example, postmodernism 
uh, purports that there are no objective truths. We are completely shackled by subjectivity. We are completely shackled by our personal biases. Hogwash, right? Gravity does not care about your identity uh, or your personal biases. Uh, the distribution of prime numbers does not depend on whether it's a Hasidic Jew who is doing the study or whether it's an indigenous uh, trans woman who is disabled. That's what makes the scientific method so beautiful is it liberates us from the shackles of our personal identities. So, so with that said, uh, I always tell people belong to the tribe of truth. That's why, by the way, it's very difficult for people to pin what my political orientation is. It's not because I'm trying to be coy and playful so that you don't know what my political views are. It's because it depends when it comes, for example, to the death penalty, uh, you would think that I'm very hawkish and very conservative. I think that if your DNA is found in the bodies of 12 children who are killed, then I think that the issue, that the idea that you know maybe maybe you are an innocent one has gone away now, and you've lost your chance to live. And I have absolutely no moral uh, you know worries about executing you. When it comes to illegal immigration, I think that uh, we shouldn't have open borders. So you would think on both of those things, I'm conservative. On the other hand, when it comes to trans issues and gay rights. I'm about as socially liberal as they come. You would think that I am to the left of occasional cortex, also known as Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez cortex. So, so I'm not a man of political tribalism. You give me an issue and then I offer you an opinion. On some, I'm going to be to the left. On others, I'm going to be to the right. So it's in that sense that I say belong to the tribe of truth, to the tribe of principles rather than to political tribes. So does the tribe of truth overlap with the tribe of anti-dogmatism uh well i mean if you are someone who is scientifically minded then you should not be dogmatic in the following sense science is provisional so the truths in science are provisional in that what we thought was true uncontestably true incontestably true 300 years ago may no longer be true today so we so in science we talk about epistemic humility right if you show me evidence today that darwinian uh, evolutionary theory is wrong well then i'd have to accept it and it's back to the drawing board on the other hand though uh when i know something to be true lest you show me that i'm wrong then i do walk with the swagger of someone who really thinks that they are on the right side of an issue. So for example, when it comes to evolution, the amount of evidence that I can share with you to demonstrate that evolution is a vertical theory uh, supersedes the amount of evidence we have for gravity. So it's going to take a lot for you to try to anchor me away from my position on evolution. On the other hand, you mentioned earlier about uh, Canada having uh, you know, uh, been one of the first countries to legalize marijuana. If you ask me, so what are the pros and cons of the legalization of marijuana? Then my answer would be one of epistemic humility in that I will say to you, Sean, you know, I don't know enough about that story to be able to offer you a definitive position. So I think someone who truly believes in the tribe of truth is someone who is well calibrated about what they know and what they don't know. When I know, I walk as though I know. And when I don't know, I, I'm humble about it. So what do you think of Tolstoy's quote then, that the highest flight of wisdom is to admit that we know nothing? Uh, well, I mean, maybe it's a bit hyperbolic. It's not true that we know nothing. For example, I do know that men are on average taller than women. I do know what the distribution of prime numbers is. But as a general rule, I get what he's saying. He's basically arguing for an, for, for an extreme point of epistemic humility, right? Uh, what is true is that the more that we know, the more that we realize how little that we know, uh, right? Uh, so, so I may know a lot more than the average person, but because I know a lot, I am actually well aware of the universe of possible knowledge that is still distant from my knowledge base. Actually, one of the things that angers me the most to, to kind of link back to your earlier point about how do you handle the trolls on the internet, one of the personality characteristics that you know triggers my ire the most is what i uh, you know the what i call the walking dunning kruger types right dunning kruger is the phenomenon of you know being arrogant in your stupidity and as a matter of fact by the way dunning was my professor my doctoral professor at cornell university he was one of my psychology professors and so i really hate how every single person on twitter is the next einstein and newton combined and so, for example, I get tons of people 
who basically have the literacy level of an amoeba who write to me and say, well, you know, you are a faux scientist because, you know, you study evolutionary psychology. Oh, geez, who knew? I mean, who knew that myself and all of the other evolutionary scientists who've dedicated the past 30 years of our lives were completely engaging in faux science while between breaks when you were playing video games in your pajama pants in mommy's bedroom, uh, you were the one who are setting us straight. So that kind of haughty arrogance that is completely immersed in stupidity really draws my ire and brings out the honey badger attitude. So of all of the philosophical wisdom you've gleaned then, what do you think people can most use in their lives can apply it? Yes. I mean, there are several ways I can answer this. Let me answer one from the parasitic mind. So in chapter seven, I talk about this incredibly powerful epistemological tool for how to seek truth. And so this technique is called nomological networks of cumulative evidence. So forgive me, it's a mouthful. So if I can just have a couple of minutes to, to, to break it up. Yeah. Uh, so let's suppose uh, I were to try to convince you, Sean, that uh, toy preferences have a certain sex specificity, right? Boys prefer certain toys, girls prefer certain toys. And that's not due because of mommy and daddy being sexist pigs, but rather there are some evolutionary biological reasons why t boys and girls have those sex specific toys. Well, how would I build a nomological network to prove that to you? Well, what I would have to do is I'd wanna show you data from across species, across cultures, across time periods, across methodologies, across theoretical frameworks, all of which then point to that unassailable fact. So it's an incredibly powerful tool to adjudicate between falsehoods and truths. So let me, I won't build the entire nomological network for toy preferences, but I'll give you a few examples. So for example, I can get you data from other animals, vervet monkeys, rhesus monkeys, chimpanzees, to show you that they exhibit the same sex specificity. Already that serves as a death nail on the coffin of the social constructivist because you would have to then argue that uh, the parents of the vervet monkeys are sexist pigs, right? And you'd have to argue that the parents of the vervet monkeys are sexist pigs, which of course is silly. I can get you data from around the world, completely different cultures where they exhibit the exact same sex specific toy preferences. I can get you data from 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, where if you do an analysis of the funerary monuments, you see little boys and little girls playing with the exact same type of toys as today. So bit by bit, I can put the epistemological noose around your neck, so to speak, to demonstrate to you that my position is the veridical one. So I think uh, from an epistemological point of view, if people learn to think that way, rather than being emotionally hysterical when debating ideas, then we would have much better debates between one another. Have you analyzed world war cycles uh world war cycles you said yes uh, i have no i have not what what are you what are you thinking i'm just wondering how you know you see society shaping up in the future it seems that we've you know earlier on we discussed the tribalism and the worst part of that is when world wars erupt and if you go back hundreds of years you see the casualties increased because military technology has increased. I'm wondering how you see that developing in the future. Well, I mean, there are several ways to, to answer this. I guess there, there was a book by Steven Pinker a few years ago where he tried to look at statistical data, arguing whether, you know, we are on the descendancy in terms of how much violence there is and so on. So, uh, you look, I don't think we're, we're ever going to get rid of the dark elements in our hearts that make us covet the, that which the other one has, right? So many of the wars is because there's one tribe that wants to get the women of the other tribe. And the only reason why I can't achieve that goal is because there are men on the other tribe that would not be happy to lose whatever uh, the other tribe wants. That's why the Ten Commandments has, do not covet your neighbor's wife for a reason. That's why the seven deadly sins have envy as one of the seven deadly sins. So I don't think we'll ever eradicate the impulses that cause conflict between people, between groups of people, between nations. But I think that there are mechanisms by which we can reduce the likelihood of that happening. So uh, as you probably have, have heard the, the oft-cited study that, you know, democracies typically don't 
get into wars with each other. When we become truly interconnected in important ways, sociopolitically, economically, culturally, it becomes a lot more difficult to create this delineation between us versus them. So in an ideal kumbaya world, uh, greater interconnectedness between people will hopefully reduce wars, but I don't think you'll ever eradicate the penchant to want to get that which the other has. I get a lot of parasites that come after me because they covet what I have. They will defame me. They will lie about me. They'll say all good things because they want that which I have. That's That's been actually one of the most difficult things to deal with, to, to actually see the ugly manifestations of people's hearts when it applies personally to me. It's, it's very disconcerting. So are you saying then that the internet, the interconnectedness of people now just talking to each other all over the world would prevent a dictator perhaps from rising and demonizing a particular country based on its race, religion or whatever, because we are connected with those people through the internet and we see they're just like us? I mean, I'd like to think so, although, of course, any tool any field of knowledge could be used for good or bad, right? Uh, physics can be used to get us to the moon. It can also be used to build atomic bombs where we eviscerate, you know, hundreds of thousands of people with one drop of a bomb. So the internet has both wonderful qualities and, and, and negative qualities. Of course, though, what you said is exactly right in that with more interactions between people who otherwise create delineations between each other, then we humanize the other. I'll, I'll give you a great personal story that speaks to this. When, when I first went to Cornell for my PhD, because I was you know, Arabic speaking, I was from Lebanon, I started hanging out with a bunch of Arab guys who, who were not Jewish, but who were you know, soccer players. And of course, we shared the fact that we were all Arabic speaking and so on. And so one day, one of them uh, invited me out to, to, uh, for a coffee. And as we were sitting there, he said, you know, Gad, I, I really like you. I said, I won't mention his name in case the one in a million chance he's watching. I don't want to embarrass him. Uh, he says, uh, I said, well, wh why do you say this as though you are surprised? He goes, well, I said, is it is it because I'm Jewish? He said, well, you know, but Gad, you're not really a Jew, Jew. I said, well, no, I'm a Jew, 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 Jew. Uh, what he meant was, you know, I was an Arabic speaking Jew. I wasn't like those other Jews, though the really evil Jews. I'm one of those rare kind of non-Jewish Jews. And so he, he was trying to humanize me because he had grown up in an environment where it was perfectly reasonable to de dehumanize the Jews. And for him, the schema didn't fit. Gad is cool. Gad is a great soccer player. Gad is an Arabic speaker. He's Arabic just like me. That doesn't make sense with my schema of the Jews. So I'd like to think that his interaction with me allowed him to then go on in his life. This was almost you know, 30 plus years ago to no longer de dehumanize the Jews. So I do think that by having people interact with each other, we can get rid of the parasitic de dehumanization that the propagandists typically engage in. So what do you believe is the meaning of life? Well, it's a big one. I guess I'm trying to address that in the in my next book where I talk about a recipe for the good life. That's the tentative title of the book. Look, I think uh, it, it's going to sound cliche, but I cliche-ish, but I truly think that living a life full of purpose and meaning is really the way to go. So for I, I truly do wake up every day, you know, with anticipation. And I kind of rub my hands together because there are so many great opportunities coming up that day. I'm going to work on my next book, as I did earlier today at the cafe. Then I'm going to be speaking to Sean Atwood, a guy that I didn't know just three days earlier, but I found out about. That's going to be exciting. Then after that, I'm speaking to a former friend who's a, uh, not sorry, a former colleague. She's now retired. She's still a friend who's an English literature professor. Then after that, I have a meeting with a one of my thesis students. And, and that constant variety seeking across intellectual landscapes gives me great pleasure. So, of course, you want to have a family if, if, if that interests you. You want to extend your genes to future generations. But I think from a, on a day-to-day -day basis, the fact that I can wake up and feel as though however small my influence is, I am contributing in some meaningful way gives me great solace. I can go to bed at night feeling excited about the next day. So my feeling is that if you are lucky enough to find that purpose and meaning, then you're well on your way to living a happy life. Well, you're absolutely glowing with that purpose and meaning. I can feel your energy from here in London. 
But what do you say to perhaps the people who are struggling, people who have not been able to um, put that you know energy into doing something that they enjoy? Perhaps they're stuck in a job they don't like, or they're unemployed, or their family members they're disconnected from them. What what do you say to those people? Perhaps what what would the tools be for them to be inspired and to get yeah. closer to where you are? Yeah, what well, great question. Uh, Look, uh, I recently went on a weight loss journey. Historically, I was a very thin person. Uh, I was a competitive soccer player. I was a marathoner. And then in my around mid twenties, I started putting on weight for the next 25 years. And at one point I was approximately 80 pounds heavier than I currently am. And, uh, for many, many years, I failed at, you know, losing weight permanently because I chunk the whole thing as I'm never going to be able to lose 80 pounds. It seems like such an insurmountable thing. But then I broke it down. So my mindset changed from sort of black and white to incremental, right? Small steps. And then suddenly I'm five pounds lighter. Then I'm 12 pounds lighter. Then I'm 27 pounds lighter. And then suddenly one day I wake up a year later and I simply can't believe that I'm in size 34 pants, that I'm the same weight I was 25, 30 years ago. So how do I link that to what you asked me? Uh, you may not be able to immediately find that uh, elixir of life that gives you purpose and meaning. But uh, even though you have a job that sucks, you love to learn, start watching YouTube clips of people that you admire. Start reading more assiduously. There's always an opportunity to take a small step that makes today better than yesterday. So the way that, so link, to link it back to my weight loss journey, Every single day, I start the day with saying, I simply want to be a bit lighter than the day before. It could be 0 0.02 grams, but then I've won that day. Now, multiply that by 365 days, suddenly you're 80 pounds lighter. So I don't think there's a magic recipe, but at least there is a mindset of incremental improvement and growth. Find those small steps, and then suddenly, a year later, you're in a completely different place in your life. So apart from coming from Lebanon then, what have been the biggest challenges in your life? I guess one of the tough parts has been, uh, although, I mean, it's tough, but also it's rewarding because I feel as though I'm doing something that matters. It's been to try to convince my academic colleagues of the veracity of using evolutionary psychology to study uh, you know, human affairs. Most of my colleagues, uh, who are in the social sciences consider it completely heretical to argue that biology matters when it comes to studying human phenomena. Sure, biology explains the behavior of the mosquito, the zebra, and the giraffe, but what are you talking about, Dr. Saad? It doesn't explain consumer behavior. Well, what do you mean? You think that consumers somehow exist on a plane that is outside the purview of biology? And so from a professional perspective, I think it has been very, very difficult to try to convince the majority of my colleagues and certainly the ones who are housed in business schools that biology, physiology, our hormones affect our behaviors as employees, as employers, as traders, as consumers. So I think, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not the same battle as you know trying to escape a live Lebanon, but from a professional perspective, that's been a really difficult war to wage. But as I said, it makes it fun because I'm doing something that people feel very strongly about whether they are strong supporters of what I do or whether they hate what I do, people care. And that's all you can ask for when you're an intellectual. Fantastic. I'm just putting a shout out to the viewers then. Dr. Gad Saad is the author of The Parasitic Mind, available worldwide. And if you want to ask him a question on this live stream, whether you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, post it and we will get those questions up on my screen right here. And okay, we've got one already. It is <laughs> from Rebecca Nickel on YouTube. Does Gad distinguish between trolls who mean what they say and those who are just attention seeking or deliberately provocative? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if I've got a taxonomy by which I judge the difference between these two. Usually what, uh, usually what will cause me to, let's say, block someone it's never because they disagree with a position. It's never, uh, you know, I, I take a position on Justin Trudeau and they take an opposing one. Oh, that upsets me. I block them. Usually what upsets me are personal offenses. Now, I don't know if that's because of my, you know, honey badger mindset, whether it's in part because I'm from the Middle East, maybe it's a bit of both, but I, I have a 
a protocol of personal conduct, which if you violate, for example, if, if you don't know me and I'm probably old enough to be your father and you're a 21 year old hack because I see your, your, your bio photo and on your on Twitter and you speak to me in a way that you certainly wouldn't want to be someone to be speaking to your dad, that offends me. And so I might block you not because I'm, I don't want opposing views, but because you're an asshole that deserves to, for me to never hear of your existence again. I was soiled for the two seconds that I knew of your existence. And so that's usually what causes, what triggers my ire and causes me to block people. Right, we've got another question come in from Lofa Sheffield on YouTube for Dr. Sad. Which one of his Sad Truth guests provoked the worst reaction from the perpetually offended? <laughs> okay, so not, okay, so from others, from the audience members. Um, I mean, there's been a few, uh, I would say maybe uh, from, I'm trying to remember from my recent past because I've had hundreds of guests. I, I know that I guess when Abigail Schreier came on, she's the one who wrote uh, uh, the book on trans activism. Some people were upset about that. Uh, but probably the one that people most got upset about is uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, you know, who, for those of you who don't know, is a very good friend of mine. He's been on my show a few times. I've been on his. And so by virtue of us being linked, then I too must be, you know, some white supremacists and so on. <laughs> Uh, incidentally, uh, this this is literally true that uh, in 2017, both Jordan and I were supposed to appear uh, at a university function at Ryerson University on the stifling of free speech on university campuses. That was the title of the event. Guess what happened to that event? It was stifled. It was shut down. So the irony was lost on those idiots. And uh, this was happening in Toronto. And uh, they put out a whole bunch of flyers, the ones who were shutting us down saying we don't want uh you know white supremacist neo-nazis uh, in toronto so the lebanese jew who escaped execution in lebanon was apparently a white supremacist neo-nazi so i make for a really bad jewish neo-nazi uh so but this is the kind of insanity that you see online so you really have to kind of go like this and laugh about it and maybe use it as material for your next book because otherwise it would drive you to suicide <laughs> that triggered a little anecdote the when I was in Arizona jail for ecstasy, there's various religious diets and to get the vegetarian diet, I converted to the Hindu religion, but the most coveted diet was the Jewish diet. It was kosher food blessed by the rabbi. So you had these skinheads, these neo-Nazi area brotherhood guys converting to, to Judaism. Jewish, yeah. To get the Jewish food. So when, they, when the food came, you had the Aryan Brotherhood Jews, you had the Mexican Mafia Jews, Italian Mafia Jews. <laughs> even Sammy the Bull's son was uh, in on this at one point. <laughs> any 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 Muslim Brotherhood Jews? Um, so the Black Gang was the Mau Mau in the Arizona prison system. So I'm not sure if they were going to Muslim religious services or not, because they are actually a minority. I would say that the 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 most of the prison population was um, it was Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and then whites were probably the third biggest group. Yeah, but it was hilarious to see these Nazis converting. <laughs> Can I ask you a quick question? Actually, I don't know how much time we have, but yeah, we could go for it, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, how 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 serious? Well, okay. Before I ask you the question, I'll I'll tell you an anecdote that's kind of leading to the question. I was once uh, visiting an area in Quebec called Charlevoix and I was reading a book about a forensic psychiatrist. And it turns out that the owner of this uh, bed and breakfast place that I was going to had worked with the psychiatrist in LA County. And uh, so he tells me, uh, he knew that I, I mean, we discussed that, you know, I have a brother in Southern California and I often go to Southern California and so on. He, get, he says to me, you know, uh, don't ever get caught up for something that sends you to LA County because if the cops don't like you, they'll throw you in with the bad guys and say fresh, fresh fish out of water and then they will have at you. So I guess you know where I'm going with this next. How likely are you to walk into prison without being someone's lady friend? Okay, so... I was fortunate, I'm not a big tough guy, but some other people got arrested with me, including my best friend from childhood who was six foot two and like like this big. Um, but as soon as you go in, they charge check you and they heart check you. So any crimes against women or kids, you're gonna get a beat down. 
pedophiles kos kill on site and then heart check is someone just comes and tests you gives you some shit. if you cower down they're going to be lined up at your cell taking everything you got and renting you out as a prison prostitute and prison rape is now so common in america that under the prison rape elimination act all the guys going in have to go to a rape class to get taught how not to get raped and there's a video and you watch some predators in the day room on the video young people come in are hungry they take food from the predators they can't pay it and the, the predators say look you got to pay for that now you're going to get stabbed well how am i going to pay go in that room over there and do what he says and once they've fallen for that that's called getting turned out or becoming a prison punk and they're rented out as prison prostitutes so it's really sad uh you know a lot of the dark stuff that goes on and, and before i got arrested i fought prisoners you know serial killers pedophiles rapists but under the war on drugs i think one of the highest arrest categories was weed possession and back when i was arrested there was hundreds of thousands of arrests for that so i saw like black kids mexican kids you know two to five years for a bit of weed because they had prior convictions so they went after the lowest hanging fruit to fill the private prisons the contracts which now are in the tens of billions a year so it appears to me that it's been a shakedown on the taxpayers. All these low-level drug users just mass incarcerated, wow. hundreds of thousands of women included. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, thanks for, for that answer. I mean, that's that's what I thought. But uh, my goodness, I mean, uh, it seems inconceivable for me to walk into such an environment where you know that, you know, short of you being able to defend yourself, and there's always someone tougher than you in prison, that you might become someone's lady friend. It's 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 a tough reality to face. Wow. Yeah, it happens quite a lot. All right. So my next question for you is then yeah. how do you feel then when you have a guest on your channel, but a certain section of your subscribers hold you responsible for having that person on, even though you're not endorsing that person's viewpoint? It seems like people expect you to only have people on whose viewpoint yeah. you endorse. I despise that attitude. As a matter of fact, I detest people who will only speak to those who fit their brand image, right? So I know some pretty famous public intellectual friends of mine who, you know, will conduct the whole consulting analysis before they decide to speak to someone. Whereas for me, right? I mean, I, I could have said, and with no, with no disrespect intended, well, I don't, you know, I'm a fancy schmancy professor. I don't want to speak to this ex-criminal who was, right? But you know what? You you paid your your debt. Uh, you undoubtedly are doing something worthwhile today, and I'm not going to judge, uh, you know, my ability to have a chat with you today based on something that you did wrongly in the past. I've spoken to porn stars where people said you're a fancy professor, you're speaking to some idiot, and then they usually say some bad words, uh, or you know, you're speaking to this former Islamic terrorist, or you're speaking to this uh, anti-Muslim guy. So, or Deepak Chopra, right? People said. You consider yourself to be the man of science and the man of reason, then, and yet you speak to this quack who preaches all this new age quackery. Uh, look, most people have interesting stories if you know how to have good conversations with them. And so I may not agree with some of the new age stuff that Deepak Chopra has, has said, but yet he's a man who's, who's accomplished a lot. If anything, he's a very good marketer, a marketer of his ideas. There's a lot that we can learn from his story. So I detest that kind of attitude whereby, you know, either people get upset because I talk to someone or that I shouldn't myself agree to speak to them. Ridiculous. If you're an interesting person, I want to talk to you. And isn't that the way to learn more about the world and human nature rather than just everybody singing off the same hymn sheet? Exactly right. Listen, Joe Rogan, you, you mentioned him very early in our chat. Joe Rogan has become successful, not because he's got the fanciest degrees. He doesn't. Not because uh, he's got all sorts of letters before or after his name. He doesn't. It's because he undoubtedly scores very high on openness, uh, on the openness metric. He scores very high on intellectual curiosity. And therefore, because, and he's very real and authentic. Now you take that cocktail, you put it together, it results in a hundred and ten million dollar offer from Spotify, right? <laughs> and so, and and again, why did that happen? Because he says, "I'm going to talk to everybody." Now, everybody doesn't mean you know, you know, literally everybody, but it means people of all polit political stripes. One day, I mean, I remember, maybe not the last time I spoke to him, but maybe two times ago when I was on a show, I think I was sandwiched between 
uh, the prior guest was some comedian where every second word was the F word. And then he was speaking to Sir Roger Penrose, who ended up winning the Nobel Prize in physics. Right? <laughs> so that is laudable, right? He could speak to the F dropping comedian one day and to Sir Roger Penrose the next day. That's what we should all aspire to be. And I did watch you interview the porn star. I'm going to urge people to go to your channel, of which you have about a quarter of a million subscribers. We'll get that link uh, below this video. We've got another a question coming from Fixed Grin. Do you study geometria? I don't know what that is, so I, I, apparently not. What What is geometria? It's a Jewish form of numerology in which the letters of the Hebrew alphabet are substituted with corresponding numbers. I've never heard of it. Oh, no, no, I don't. I mean, I guess the closest that I've come to hearing about something similar i think there is in some jewish mysticism there is this idea that you know all answers are to be found in the torah so if you want to see uh, the name hitler go to the third paragraph you'll see the letter h but this is the type of pattern making that could allow me to come up with anything you want from any book and so no i'm not a strong proponent of numerology in general Nancy Dahl has asked, which one of your guests did you find the most interesting? Try wow. not to cause try not to cause offense to all your other guests there. <laughs> that yeah, that's it. Of... <laughs> yeah, to be honest with you, I would say 95% of my guests have been lovely and interesting. And I'm not saying this to be diplomatic. There's there have been a few that in retrospect uh, I would have preferred not to speak to them. But in terms of interesting, I mean, probably one of the ones that most comes to mind. Uh, is Hamid Abdel Samad, who is a the son of a uh, Islamic cleric from Egypt. So he was born into you know a heavy duty kind of Islamic theological background. He left Egypt, moved to Germany, became a staunch anti uh, Islamic uh, critic, and a and a best selling author in Germany. And we connected. We 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 became friends. He came on my show. More than anything, what I love about him, because I got to know him also in the offline world, we, we met in Montreal and so on, he just exudes poise. He's, he's someone who carries himself with such a, a dignified poise, and I highly respect that. So just off the top of my head, he is certainly someone that I love, but, but I've had so many amazing people that it's hard for me to, to point to specific ones. So we're getting asked a lot about Jordan Peterson. Perhaps you could highlight just some of the chats you've had with him, some what were the highlights? Uh, so Jordan and I first met, he, he reached out to me, uh, you know, I, I didn't know him, it was before he had become, you know, ultra famous. He reached out to me uh, in 2016, when he was going through the uh, gender pronoun, uh, uh, you know, conundrum, uh, debacle. And uh, he said, Hey, I'm a fan of your show. Uh, I'm wondering if I could come on your show, we can have a conversation. And, and of course, uh, very few people w wanted to talk to him then because most academics certainly are spineless, castrated cowards. And therefore, uh, you know, we, we struck up a friendship. We became good friends. We, we went on many events together. Uh, and, you know, as I said, he's been on my show. I've been on his. Uh, what have we talked about? I mean, m many things, because as you could imagine, when Jordan and I get together, we're not short of topics to discuss. Usually it revolves around some elements of psychology, evolutionary psychology, philosophy. Uh, we even broach the subject, you know, one of the only subjects that we disagree on is, uh, you know, the importance of Carl Jung. Uh, uh, he's a huge Jung fan. I'm not as much. And so in our last chat, I can't remember if it was on my show or his, we, we touched that topic. And uh, I actually offered him a psychological explanation for the so-called synchronicity effect that Jung is so famous for. And to his credit, uh, and which shows you what kind of class act he is and uh, how he is epistemologically humble, he said, you know what? I think you've convinced me. Uh, that's, that's a measure of how great uh, an academic is when you could take a position that they've otherwise held. De and I'm not saying he renounced on Jung, but at least on that very small point, he was willing to concede the point uh, you know, if we could all be that intellectually honest, then uh, we're well on our way to doing something great. Do you have any thoughts on Jung's theory of archetypes? 
Uh, I do. I actually, th this is where people misunderstood my uh, aversion to Jung. It's not that he didn't say certain things that I fully agreed with. As a matter of fact, the idea that there are universal archetypes is well, well rooted in evolutionary thinking, right? Uh, if you want to study what are the things that women fantasize about when it comes to men, study romance novels, study the archetype of the male hero in romance novels, and it will tell you all you need to know about what women find desirable. So there are many things that Jung said that were correct, inclu including his general ideas behind archetypes, although not necessarily the collective unconscious. Uh, what I think I have an aversion to when it comes to Jung is some of the the booga booga stuff, right? Some of the esoteric, cultist, occultist stuff. That's pure bullshit. That is not rooted in, in the scientific method. There is no way to test that stuff. And so that's really the stuff that I disagree with. Uh, look, if I were to say something today that was utterly insane, that completely defies the most basic scientific tenets, then people would question the veracity of me as a scientist, right? So in the case of Jung, he said some wonderfully astute and insightful things, but some truly insane bullshit things. And so when I usually critique Jung, it's for his garbage rather than his good points. So it's a case of extracting the gems, is it? Like you hear people, they say, okay, I can't stand anything that Freud, for example, said, because one theory of his was proven wrong over time. They dismiss everything he ever did. Exactly. What do you think about that kind of an attitude? Well, again, it's an all, all or nothing thinking that is simply wrong. I mean, for some things, a, a deontological perspective, a all or nothing thought process makes sense. When it comes to the truth, you should not be a consequentialist. Something is true or not. But when it comes to many things in life, we need a nuanced approach. Look, I'll, I'll give you someone who's even much more brilliant than uh, Freud. Uh, how about Sir Isaac Newton, right? Well, Sir Isaac Newton was a proponent of alchemy. Right. So I'm not going to reject his theories in calculus because he believed in bullshit stuff about alchemy. Right. Or, or for example, I might argue that his some of his religious ideas I'm not a fan of because I'm not much of a religious person. But I would be the last person to question uh, Newton's brilliance when it came to mathematics. I mean, he's done more in a given day than most of us will do in an entire life. Uh, so I agree with you. Uh, and so that's why I think people completely misconstrued misconstrued my position on Jung. He had some deeply insightful things, but I wish he stayed away from all the new age quackery. Any uh, gems from Nietzsche? <laughs> the, the, the God God is dead guy. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't think off the top of my head, but I do, if I'm not mistaken, I, I pulled out a quote of his that I haven't yet verified. I'm very punctilious about making sure that you know, when you pick up quotes that they're truly from the source, because otherwise you get all kinds of garbage. There's, I think, because in one of the ch chapters of my next book, uh, I, have a, I have a chapter titled Life as a Playground. Uh, and so I wanted to quote a bunch of famous philosophers on their view of play. And I think there is some quote of his, which I can't yet uh, guarantee that it's him, where it says something to the effect of, you, you know, the 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 man who stops playing is dead or something to that effect. So that's probably the one that comes to mind, if only because I was writing a section on, on playful behavior. Maybe someone in your, in your thing will, will correct me or will give me the correct quote. Yeah, I mean, he was very playful and he loved music as well. He said, what is life without music? And I think towards the end, before he went insane, he, he I think he visited India and he was spied through a hotel room um, doing some Shakti dance naked. <laughs> <laughs> right well speaking of you said you mentioned uh insane i just yesterday i was working on a section in in another chapter of my forthcoming book where i was talking about so in french you say that la maladie créatrice like the the creativity inducing malady the idea is that there is a link between psychopathology and creativity and i was arguing uh, from from a very interesting paper that uh, not my paper, someone else's paper, that it's really an inverted U shape, right? If if you're not at all mentally ill, then you don't have the the freedom to explore new sort of out of the box thinking. So a bit of malady 
is good. Of course, if you're too mentally ill, then you can't function and you can't then produce creative things. So there is some kind of sweet spot in the middle where having some maladie créatrice makes sense. And so it's interesting that you mentioned mental illness because I was just writing a section on that in my next book. Dr. Gadsad, what an inspirational interview. We started out with the <laughs> toughness of the honey badger and we ended up on playfulness and music i can't thank you enough it's been an absolute delight and you know would, would love to do something with you in the future wish love you all it. the best and people out there if you want to get the parasitic mind the book it is available worldwide gad has a youtube channel and he interviews all kinds of people on the channel i've been watching it today extremely fascinating we'll have all the links in the description box below this video anything you would like to say finally to the viewers uh just thank you for watching thank you for uh supporting all of these alternative uh forums it, this these types of forums have democratized all kinds of conversations sean and i would have never had the venn diagram intersecting <laughs> were it not for these media so thank you Sean, for this opportunity and uh, i hope that we'll stay in touch all right you have a great rest of your day in canada cheers thank you cheers bye take care bye